Uh, I took a taxi uh, here today, and the, the taxi driver asked me uh, what I was here for, and I explained, and I explained what I was talking about, and he said, it's blindingly obvious. Uh, he didn't quite say it like that. He said it in a rather more fruity fashion, shall we say, a rather more forthright fashion. Uh, and he said, you know, it's blindingly obvious, basically, that, uh, that the UK would suffer if it did decide to leave uh, the European uh, Union. Uh, I didn't disagree, because I've learned in the past that uh, arguing with taxi drivers uh, is, uh, is a bit of a mistake. Um, but, you know, speaking to an audience in this country, uh, a lot of what I'm going to say may seem blindingly obvious in the sense of the costs associated uh, with a uh, withdrawal from the EU for the UK's foreign and security policy are obvious. But I have to say that for uh, a UK-based audience, they're perhaps not so obvious. And the debate, I think, on this area in particular has only just, has only just got going. So um, I apologise uh, in advance uh, if some of this uh, sounds a bit like teaching uh, uh, you to, to suck eggs. Uh, but as you're all aware, and I know that there was a discussion here a couple of days ago, you know, the, the British Prime Minister announced his intention to have an in-out referendum. That referendum is going to take place, uh, he would hope, uh, by the end of, of 2017. And we've now got a fair sense of, in outline, uh, what the issue areas are that the, the Prime Minister wants to, to have a discussion uh, on. And that discussion at the moment uh, is, uh, is framed in terms of technical talks about what the substantive issues might be. And we'll, I think, be closer in December and at the December European Council having a, a good sense of, of what the debate or the terms of the debate might be or rather what the terms of the negotiations uh, might be. And I'm, I'm really happy to talk about that uh, uh, at length if it's useful. But I wanted to focus on the foreign policy area um, for some reasons that I will make clear. It's an interesting area because I think it's one of the areas in which the UK government is not actually seeking to repatriate powers. And nothing that David Cameron has said so far or members of the British government uh, can be read as a desire to alter the status quo when it comes to uh, common foreign security policy or the common security uh, and defence policy. So one could read that as a recognition uh, of uh, uh, certainly on the part of the, the current government that it sees real benefits that derive from the UK from its engagement uh, with this process. However, what the benefits are for the UK and how those benefits uh, are understood uh, is something which isn't really uh, discussed or uh, debated uh, at length. And the, the UK Parliament uh, has a Commons Foreign Affairs Committee has just launched an inquiry into the cost and benefits for the UK of uh, a Brexit. Uh, and, and it's done that in part because there isn't really a clear body of evidence uh, which has been accumulated across time in the UK, which makes a sort of clear, coherent argument uh, for UK policymakers as to where the benefits do derive uh, for, for the UK. And again, you know, they may be obvious to everybody uh, in this room, but I don't think they've been sort of codified or marshaled in a way that I think um, is, is yet uh, digestible. So what I want to do uh, is to um, divide my uh, remarks up into several parts, and they're divided up um, to look at, first of all, where I see the current benefits lying for the UK uh, in uh, the, the CFSP, CSDP. Secondly, what the costs would be to the UK for a Brexit. Then to look at what some of the, um, the costs might be for the EU. Uh, of uh, the UK leaving. And finally, a whole series of timescale issues, which I think are important in terms of uh, acting as a preoccupation uh, for British foreign policy uh, if it does decide to go down the road uh, of uh, Brexit. And these issues uh, are issues that uh, uh, I had the opportunity to discuss recently with the, the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee. So, you know, uh, uh, they, they have been rehearsed previously, but um, uh, they haven't been done so uh, publicly. I think what's clear if you think about the benefits, and these hold for any uh, member state, these are not UK-specific uh, benefits, is that all aspects of foreign policy, if we widen foreign policy out to include trade and development policy, aspects of justice uh, and home affairs, even for the UK, are embedded within and pursued uh, through the European Union in such a way that it's quite difficult perhaps to disentangle you know, what is UK national foreign policy and what is uh, EU uh, policy. And the UK has certainly, as other member states have done, used its EU membership 
to enhance its international influence by using the EU to, to leverage and amplify national foreign policy. And that's perfectly you know, you know, on, uh, uh, on uh, track with what other member states have done. And I think um, the UK has, has really gained the best of both worlds through CFSP. On the one hand, it still has freedom of manoeuvre to pursue its own national foreign policy and obviously continues to do so and acts independently when it chooses to do so. But it also uh, gets to act collaboratively and leverage common resources when uh, it also has a preference to pursue that route. So I think that the foreign policy area is one that the UK has derived significant benefits from. And in particular, a state like the UK, as a, a state which has had um, a whole series of uh, lengthy uh, engagements internationally and has widespread commercial and other interests across the globe, it gives it a fantastic uh, footprint and also a way to marshal its arguments with uh, a group of other uh, member states, I think in a fairly efficient uh, and effective way. There are some real uh, 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 there are some real benefits, I think, in terms of the EU decision-making mechanism uh, or mechanisms on foreign policy for the UK to pursue its foreign security policy uh, interests. And, of course, more broadly, European integration has provided the UK with an unparalleled period of, of peace uh, with its neighbouring states, which historically uh, the UK has not enjoyed. And alongside NATO, it's played a really pivotal role in managing the transition of the continent from Cold War cleavage uh, through to what we have today. And crucially, you know, a key British foreign policy objective, end of the Cold War and onwards, has been to pursue the integration of countries in Central and Eastern Europe, in the Western Balkans, to get them as part of the, the European political mainstream and to realise key British foreign policy objectives. You know, all of this, I think, is... You know, given and actually, you know, if I was the foreign secretary standing here, that's probably what I would say in terms of what the benefits are that are derived uh, to the UK. Um, so let's raise the temperature a little bit and start to talk about what some of the potential costs would be for the UK uh, of uh, a Brexit. Well, I think the first is that it would raise a broader set of questions for the UK as to what the orientation and objectives of its national foreign and security policy should be. You know, EU membership has been a key component of the UK's diplomacy and foreign policy since 1973. There are very few people now working in ministries uh, in the UK who've had an experience of British foreign and security policy prior uh, to the UK's uh, EU accession. So the business of doing business with other member states has established you know, some fairly hardened arteries, I would suggest, in terms of the way that one communicates with other, uh, other member states. So altering that status would take the UK into an unknown situation in terms of recalibrating its relationships with its European uh, neighbours. And the fact that it's enjoyed significant efficiencies by operating through that system, the fact that it can do business with 27 other member states uh, and it's allowed to or uh, able to engage in all sorts of uh, resolution of interstate differences, uh, ironing out problems, pursuing collective positions on issues of common concern. All of that has become the way in which uh, the Foreign Office and mm. other parts of government in the UK have been in operating mode since the UK joined uh, European political cooperation uh, and obviously through its successor under the CFSP. And that's recognised uh, when you look at the words that the Prime Minister uh, has, uh, uh, has uttered uh, on the sanctions regime towards Russia, uh, for example, uh, where he makes very clear you know, that these benefits derive for the UK because there is a real efficiency benefit from getting all of these countries uh, on site. What, of course, the UK doesn't know is... The, co the cost in terms of the diplomatic and political bandwidth that would be required for an extended period, the extended period being unknown, and having an institutional preoccupation, which the UK doesn't like, doesn't like doing institutions, doesn't like talking about institutions, uh, that would come as a consequence uh, of an exit. 
And that would place an immense burden, I would suggest, on the existing infrastructure that the UK has for pursuing its foreign uh, security uh, and uh, defence policy. So whatever other things the UK thinks that it might pursue outside of the EU, it's not going to be able uh, to do so because there's going to be a real uh, opportunity cost. And I'll come back uh, to that in a moment. And all of this, of course, is in a context in which there is the most uncertain environment international environment, international security environment that the UK has faced since the middle of the 20th century. The, the combination of the broader structural shifts within international relations, shifts uh, in the balance of power, together with the, uh, the volatility that we've now got in the UK's European neighbourhood, and how you go about managing that change uh, and complexity is enough in itself without reorganising, recalibrating, restructuring the relationship with one's neighbours, uh, which has been uh, established and functioned in a particular way since the early, 19, early 1970s. And of course, this also comes on the back of uh, a period of time, recent, uh, recent history, where the UK's austerity and its struggles, as with other European countries, to deal with the global financial crisis has already raised questions about the UK's place in international relations what it can do, how it can do it, uh, and particularly the resources that it's put into foreign uh, and uh, security uh, policy uh, issues. So you've got this uh, uh, massive uh, security uh, change environment, these broader uh, struggles within uh, international relations. This arc of crisis that runs within the UK's neighbourhood, right from the east with Russia all the way through its southern borders, these multiple security challenges, into the Middle East and so on and so on, things that people are familiar with here. And it's the combined magnitude of these challenges that will require multi-institutional and multinational responses. And that the EU is going to be, whether the UK likes it or not, a central player and payer in mitigating those challenges. And so for the UK not to be uh, a part of those arrangements uh, clearly uh, would be uh, something uh, of a loss. And uh, if we sort of zoom in on some of the areas uh, where the UK is currently active, you can see that, that the UK's engagement and interest, for example, somewhere like the Horn of Africa at the moment, where it's made considerable investment to try and get the situation stabilised on the ground, now has an embassy uh, in uh, Mogadishu, where it's got FCO, MOD, DFID staff, all working to pursue uh, UK uh, foreign policy objectives, which are then leveraged to the EU's financial uh, and technical resources. All of those projects, if you like, all of those specific policies which have been designed, developed, and are being uh, implemented as part of a broader, or nested, nested within part of a broader uh, policy, would come into question. So it's, just, it's not just the macro issues, you know, the kind of bigger, broader international relations uh, issues and how those might be managed or the neighbourhood issues, but it's also the regional and the sub-regional uh, strategies and policies that the UK have put into place, uh, which would suddenly uh, be left uh, without the anchor that they have at present. And of course, member state exit has no precedent. The UK has no way to assess accurately what the cost would be for its foreign and security policy of departing from the EU. And I think it's going to be very difficult on the available evidence to calculate what those costs might be. Whether you calculate them financially, that's pretty difficult anyway uh, to do uh, when you evaluate foreign policy uh, success. Uh, whether you do that in terms of the perceptions of third countries, what people might think if the UK looked as if uh, it, was, it was exiting. Whether you do that in terms of the impact uh, on the, the British psyche. Uh, in terms of you know people's willingness to engage uh, within uh, the world outside, all of those things you know it's difficult to calculate, and we've got no reliable means to do so. The closest we've had is is when the previous government, the previous coalition government that was in power between 2005 and 2015, ran the balance of competences uh, exercise. And you may recall there are a whole series of reports produced on different aspects of EU policy. The idea being to look at you know whether the balance of competences were in favour of the nation or not in terms of the benefits that the, the UK derived. And one of the reports was on, um, was on foreign policy. 
uh, and, and amongst plenty of others, I, I uh, produced evidence that was submitted uh, to, that, uh, to that process and that report. And what was clear, and I quote from the report itself, which was uh, a masterpiece of drafting by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, uh, and it says, I quote, that all the evidence suggests that it's generally strongly in the UK's interest to work through uh, EU uh, foreign policy. And it set out why uh, that was the case in terms of greater influence over non-EU powers that derived from a position as being a leading EU country. Stress on the leading, perhaps, because that hasn't been as obvious in recent years. Uh, the international weight of the single market, again, perhaps an obvious point to make, uh, and therefore the ability to deliver on trade uh, and commercial, uh, commercially beneficial and the ability to deliver on trade agreements, the reach and magnitude of the EU's financial uh, resources in development and economic partnerships, the rail and range and versatility of the EU's tools as compared with other uh, international organisations, and so on uh, and so on. And it was clear from that exercise uh, that the UK... Uh, did not face obstacles to pursuing its foreign policy beyond those which were uh, annoyances, shall we say, that come from uh, the grit in the machine of decision-making within the EU, which many people here, uh, I'm sure, are more than familiar with. So there's no precedent for the exit. We don't really know what the costs uh, would be for UK foreign uh, and security policy. And, of course, the UK would also be going against the trend of contemporary European international relations. You know, the enlargement has been the great uh, project uh, within Europe, the dual enlargement of NATO uh, and, and the European Union. And a key part of British diplomacy has been to advocate certain domestic reforms to countries to facilitate their admission to the European Union. And that advocacy continues in cases such as Bosnia uh, and Serbia you know, to, to pursue what are very painful economic and political reforms outside the EU, I think the UK argument that these things are worth doing would obviously have very little uh, credence uh, if there was one hand uh, on, the door of the, uh, on the door of the exit. And I think that, that Brexit itself uh, would create a broader diplomatic crisis for the UK. It would have to, uh, and its diplomats, and I know there are some here, would be working overtime, unpaid, I would hope, as a taxpayer, uh, to counter the view that Britain uh, would be shrinking in its international role and influence, and uh, as happened during the Scottish independence debate, whether membership of key bodies such as the UN Security Council and so on would be appropriate for a country that's, that felt in some way to outsiders as being uh, shrunk. And of course, the United States, uh, which has already expressed uh, a clear preference for the UK to remain within the EU, would then face a UK which was in a position which was contrary to the position that successive US administrations have pursued, both Democrat and Republican, which is to seek a larger European Union and see a European Union as a key organising device for the security uh, and uh, stability of Europe. And the UK would no longer have the leverage that would come from being on the inside for future enlargements or that defence policies developed in a manner that uh, might be <coughs> compatible or strengthened rather than uh, duplicating uh, NATO. And I think from that we could obviously draw the conclusion that the UK would look diminished and would look less useful to the United States or future US uh, administrations uh, than would be uh, the case uh, in the current, uh, the current period. But I think the costs are not just on the UK side, that they are also on the EU side. The UK is a key participant in the EU's common foreign and security policy, its common security and defence policy. It hasn't always been the most enthusiastic when it's come to institutional innovation or development or deepening. Um, but in terms of participation um, and uh, in terms of its engagement with uh, CSDP missions, both military uh, and also uh, civilian missions. It has been a, a, a significant player and has obviously brought considerable expertise to bear in, in terms of debates 
uh, and discussions between the member states in areas that the UK cares about, but also in areas perhaps in which aren't first order UK concerns, but it's been able to bring uh, the perspective uh, of a state uh, which has a certain experience within, uh, within uh, foreign affairs. One thing I would say as an aside, and I found rather peculiar, uh, is that the UK seemed to derive absolutely no benefit from providing the uh, EU's first uh, high representative under the Lisbon Treaty arrangements. Uh, I don't mean that in the sense that, uh, that Baroness Ashton was there uh, as some kind of agent for the UK government, but I mean more about the British debate about the value uh, of CSDP. I think for her term uh, of office as high rep, I don't think the quality of the British public debate, certainly the British elite uh, debate perhaps outside the Foreign Office, actually improved in terms of realising what some of the benefits might be for CFSP uh, and uh, uh, for CSDP. But others in this room may have an explanation as to why that is the case. If you look at the CSDP, I mean, the, the UK uh, has been and is enthusiastic for uh, CSDP uh, operations. If you look at uh, Atalanta, it's obviously playing uh, a leading role there in terms of the uh, headquartering and directing from Northwood. It's also now made major commitments to the now for uh, MED uh, operation uh, as well. If you take a look at the uh, civilian missions of the CSDP, the UK has been present, has been present in a big way, uh, and has actually integrated uh, CSDP missions and participation in CSDP missions very much uh, at the heart uh, of its interest in capacity building in third countries. And beyond that, you know, the UK has been rather enthusiastic for thinking about the CSDP as a route to build up European military uh, capabilities. You know, push the idea of battle groups. You know, maybe battle groups haven't become all that they could have become in terms of, uh, you know, as an operational instrument for the EU. But I think uh, it clearly demonstrated that the, the UK is not against CSDP developments, but it's against CSDP developments through a particular prism uh, and is willing to, to push uh, in some areas uh, in which uh, it feels that uh, there is a benefit in terms of, in terms of capabilities development. If you look more broadly uh, to, to EU foreign policy to include development policy, again, there was a balance of competences report that was written on, on development policy. And to quote from the report, the close alignment of UK and EU development objectives and the EU's perceived uh, political neutrality and global influence mean that the EU can act as a multiplier for the UK's priorities and influence. So I think you know, a recognition uh, in uh, those constituencies in the UK that the UK does get something out of engagement, but also equally the fact that the UK does play a key role in helping uh, to develop uh, development policy within uh, the EU uh, itself, bringing its own uh, perspective. And also crucially, of course, bringing its own uh, significant national spend on foreign uh, and security policy. Let me now just sort of turn in the last section of my remarks to, to what I'd call the, the timescale uh, impact which I alluded to at the start, that the, the impact of disentangling the UK from uh, the EU's foreign security policy relationships would be, ex would be extremely costly, I think, for all sides, and with the outcome of that process, uh, completely uh, uncertain. At present, the UK is able to combine its national foreign policy assets with those of the EU in pursuing the objectives that it wants to pursue, and only agreeing... Uh, uh, with or, or to collective action if other member states also agree on that action. But the UK uh, has also, uh, or also faces uh, at the moment, another order challenge, which is the austerity challenge. So at the moment in which we're talking about the UK possibly doing less within the European Union, uh, or dramatically less if we're seeking an exit, this is also... Um, on the back of a period in which over the last five years we've seen a 16% cut in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office budget. This is in real terms cut, 19% cut in uh, the defence budget. And therefore there is a real interest on the part of the UK in cost-effectively pooling diplomatic and military capabilities further with its other partners. And to have the European Union as a route to do that closed off uh, I think would be an absolute tragedy. It would also, I think, complicate some of the key bilateral relationships that the UK has sought to, to move uh, forward on uh, over the last few years. 
and I'll just pick out one of those, which are the, the Lancaster House agreements that are reached between uh, Britain and France uh, on defence in, in 2010. And the premise of those being that it would be closer cooperation between the UK and France uh, to burden share uh, to facilitate both in their ambitions for defence within the EU and NATO. And France, to its credit, I think has persisted with the idea of this coordination, uh, and both sides, I think, have worked hard at it, even, even uh, in a climate in which there has been a reticence on the part of recent British governments to develop or to deepen EU defence policy. And I think any prospect of a UK-EU exit would raise questions over the rationale for that uh, particular uh, form uh, of bilateral cooperation. And it may make it attractive uh, for France, for example, to see if it can develop more within the Weimar grouping of Poland uh, and Germany as an alternative forum if the British can't be counted on uh, as uh, a future partner uh, within a European uh, defence. And of course, there would be the cost to the UK of renegotiating all of the things that it currently gets from the EU by way uh, of the existing corpus of agreements. Uh, talking to an analyst yesterday, he suggested that the EU currently has something in the order of 10,000 international agreements in place with third parties, give or take a 1,000, he said. Uh, and, uh, of course, on a scenario uh, we call the doomsday scenario, in which the UK did seek to, to cut uh, its links uh, from the EU uh, outside of a, an EEA-type uh, agreement, there would be a need for the UK to recodify its relationships uh, with uh, many uh, third countries. And clearly, that would create a huge burden uh, on uh, the UK's diplomatic uh, and political infrastructure to do so. And at the same time, of course, it would be renegotiating a major bilateral relationship between the EU and uh, the UK, of course, which would be uh, a... a a demanding set of negotiations, uh, I would suggest. So, in conclusion, if we would see a Brexit, which of course I think you gather I would very much not like uh, to see, the UK could well be preoccupied for the best part of a decade in reorganising and reordering its foreign relations at the time in which it has major uh, uh, major uh, issues uh, uh, within uh, international relations and within its neighbourhood uh, to give uh, attention to. And of course, at the same time, the UK would also find itself having to work as hard to try and influence the EU policy agenda from the outside as opposed to the inside, which would probably make create an additional bilateral diplomatic burden uh, from the one that currently exists. So I think in conclusion, the UK can choose a Brexit, but its security will remain intertwined with the successes and failures of the EU anyway. So it's going to be a major foreign policy preoccupation. And by the way, perhaps more parochially, with the UK presidency of the Council due in the second half of 2017, we've got to find a way, uh, and the UK government uh, clearly has to find a way of ensuring that it does the business of the presidency, which I'm sure it will do very well. It has done in the past. Uh, but it will also do it whilst potentially engaged in a national debate uh, about uh, its, future, its future relationship uh, with the EU. So I'm glad I'm not a diplomat. Um, uh, and I'm only uh, a humble uh, analyst. Uh, but one of the things I'll be fascinated to hear uh, is what the perspective is uh, from this side of the water on uh, whether, uh, whether you see uh, the UK uh, uh, having uh, a sort of meaningful and credible uh, future, even on the, the worst, uh, worst sort of doomsday uh, Brexit uh, scenario, and what the options might be for the UK. Because, of course, one of the things I haven't spoken about is what the alternative, uh, the alternative um, positioning uh, might be. And I'd, I'd be happy to talk about some of the ideas that have done the rounds uh, which have been uh, alternative uh, conceptualizations of the UK SON EU. So thank you very much. Thank you.